So next I'd like to introduce Professor Dorothy Bishop, who doesn't really need much introduction, I don't think. She's been a world leader in the field of research into SLI for many years. Um, she works at many levels. Um, her research is looking at behavioural, neurological and genetic factors, and also comparing SLI with other disorders of autism, specifically the hearing impairment, Down syndrome. So today she's going to talk about um, genetic insights into participation. Thank you very much, Susan. Yes, um, this topic is one which I'm going to actually conclude is probably not of any interest to anybody. <laughs> and I want to explain why, because I think it's a potential red herring uh, in this debate about um, classification. Um, and what I'm really going to say is that in terms of the, the difficulties that children present with, um, sorry, in terms of making a diagnostic classification, you can do it on the basis just of observed behaviour, which is really what Courtney was talking about, you know, what sort of language problems do you have. In the medical model, the sort of gold standard for coming up with diagnostic categories is thought to be making a diagnosis in terms of underlying causes, which is where potentially genetics comes in. And then there's a third interesting option, which is that it's sometimes used in uh, literature on reading disabilities, that one of the things that you should be using in terms of uh, information to make a diagnosis is response to intervention. But what I really want to argue is the one that you want to use really depends on why you're doing this classification. And that there are research purposes <coughs> in which this middle one, this underlying causes one, is really useful. But I think it's not going to be at all useful for the sort of debate we're having today, which is much more concerned with how we actually both identify and then categorise children uh, who might, for example, uh, be allocated uh, speech and language therapy or admission to a special school or whatever. Um, but I just will tell you a bit about the genetic research to explain why I think uh, it's not going to work. Um, when Fox P, the FOXP2 mutation was discovered, which I think probably most people will have heard about, so this is the famous KE family who had this mutation um, in a single, or really just one change in one DNA, DNA base pairing uh, affected individuals in the family associated with a but quite severe speech and language disorder. And you could see this running through the family and it was discovered partly because it was so clear cut, it looked just like a sort of straightforward, if you've got this mutation, there's a 50% chance that your kids will get it, and if you've got it, you're pretty well certain to have a speech and language disorder. And this was discovered uh, about 20 years ago, and I think when it was discovered, we all thought, oh, well, this might prove to be the explanation for speech and language disorders, they had both speech and language disorders in this family. Um, and people started looking for mutations of this gene in other affected families, particularly ones with many members. And basically, virtually nothing was found. There's, a, there's in the literature one or two other cases which have something, not the same mutation, but some other thing disrupting this gene. But essentially, this is a red herring for the majority of cases of, of children with speech and language disorders. <coughs> so instead, what we seem to be coming to the conclusion about the remaining huge number of children who have these problems is that they are what are called complex multifactorial disorders, which means that uh, they don't have a simple straightforward etiology. Um, they, the, the nice way of phrasing it, which I find really rather memorable, is that they aggregate but do not segregate from families, which simply means that if you have got this disorder in a child, their relatives are more likely to have the same type of problem than the general population. But you can't trace it down as a sort of nice, simple, inherited pattern. It's not Mendelian, we'd say it doesn't obey the classic rules of genetics. Um, so you get something much more messy, like, oop, we need to do that, like this little uh, thing down here, family tree, which, you know, you show that to a geneticist, they say, well, that looks messy. Um, <laughs> and basically, this is actually, though, the commonest sort of way genetics works for disorders that are common. So there's been a lot of research on this type of on, uh, model of inheritance for things like heart disease, for things like asthma, for things like allergies. They're all like this. They're all things where we thought, oh, we will find the gene for asthma, we will find the gene for heart disease. And instead they're finding that what you've got, it seems, is a lot of genes, each of which have a small effect, and also you have environmental risk factors which combine with those. Oh, I keep losing this, but, um, and what you get is this, I put it on its side, but this normal distribution. 
I've shown it for height because that's another human trait that seems to have the same sort of causality where there's not a gene that makes you tall or short, there's lots of genes, some of them nudge you up, some of them nudge you down. If you're very unfortunate, you might actually get lots and lots of them that push you in one direction or the other, so you're really an outlier. There are also <laughs> mut rare mutations that might make you extremely short or extremely tall, but they're not explaining most of the variation in height. Most of it is all to do with variation in the normal range. And how do we therefore uh, find the genetic causes of these sorts of things, given that we're talking about lots of genes of small effect? Well, to establish that there is a genetic influence and how big it might be, you can do the sorts of <coughs> studies that I've been involved in where you might look at uh, relatives such as twins to see how far behavioral similarities between people uh, relate to their genetic similarity. Um, the other thing you can do is get into the lab and do molecular genetics, so you're then sort of peering down the microscope looking for bits of genes that are associated with language disorders. But the mapping is incredibly imprecise, and I think this is why this is not really particularly useful. It's very interesting for those of us into these things, but um, it's really not the case that you, it's not like POTSP2. It's not that you've got little bits of genes that have very particular effects and everybody who's got that particular version looks the same. It's quite the opposite. <coughs> so this is a study I did, a twin study that I did a long time ago now, but when I was in Manchester, and this is just showing you, if you've got a, one twin who has, meets criteria for specific speech and language disorder with a big discrepancy between nonverbal IQ and language, uh, and this is what their other twin looks like. And um, these are identical twins, so they're genetically the same, and these are non-identical twins who are similar, but not as similar as these identical twins. And the yellow area shows you, therefore, the proportion of Twi affected twins who have another twin with the same, who meets the same criteria, meets criteria for a specific speech and language disorder. And you can see that a lot of them do, <coughs> more here than here, and that's one of the bits of information that tells you this is likely to be a genetically based disorder. But then what you see is that it's not the case that the other twins are always entirely fine. So the blue area is a load of them who meet, have often very similar language profiles, but don't meet the IQ discrepancy criteria. So these are children with poor language, non-verbal IQ is the sort of thing that Courtney was talking about, not really desperately intellectually handicapped, but um, floating around probably with non-verbal IQs between 17 and 85. So this is low language, so they are common. You, it's common to find one twin with specific language impairment, the other with this more um, general uh, abilities low in both language and non-verbal. And then this pink area, are the ones who have problems that seem to have resolved. So these are children who, when we tested them, looked fine, but they had a history of having had speech and language therapy. And so you, this is a case where one twin hasn't resolved and the other twin has, but they're genetically identical. <coughs> so it's quite clear that the genes uh, might determine whether you're likely to have some sort of problem, but they do not specify uh, whether it's uh, likely to be specific or whether it, how quickly it's likely to resolve. Um, another example from molecular genetics is just to say that we're all very excited in this field with something called the catnap gene. It's not really spelled like catnap, but it's a, it looks a bit like that, nobody calls it that. This is a, a, a gene that was looked at because the FOXP2 gene is a controller gene that turns other genes on and off, and this is one of the ones it turns on and off, and it was thought to possibly be important. And indeed it has been found to be important in that the version of this gene that you have determines your risk for a whole load of things. But these things are hugely variable. Autism, specific language impairment, dyslexia, ADHD, schizophrenia, and in the general population, the age at which you first learn to talk. Um, and there's also some people who have disruptions of this gene, and there's associations with Tourette's syndrome and epilepsy. Now, the other thing to say about this is that we're not talking about hit mutations here. We're talking about a gene that has different versions in different people, and these different versions uh, are quite common in the general population. So we're talking about probabilistic increases in risk. We're not, again, talking about, oh, you've got this version, you're going to have a problem. We're just saying, you've got this version, if it's in combination, perhaps, with other genes that push you in the same direction, or environmental factors that are not so good, 
you're more likely to fall in the range of bang you um, Why is there so much variation? Um, I mean, there, this is well known again in the field of medicine. There are things like tuberous sclerosis, where you know that it, even if it's a single particular genetic mutation, the impact can be very different from one person to the next. It can range from severe handicap with massive changes in the brain to tiny little skin changes. And the precise impact seems to possibly depend on what other genes you've got, so the genetic, what we call the genetic background, environmental factors may be important, although we often don't know what they are. Uh, but there's also just random effects in how genes operate, whether something switches on and off. A lot of the way uh, genetic factors work is rather probabilistic, and it's not genetically determined. So, having said all that, um, I'm sorry to conclude that you did ask me to talk about <laughs> genetics, but uh, I don't think this is uh, going to help. So I think there are people uh, who have, were hopeful that, you know, with the Fox B2 thing, that we're going to sort of then get a classification of language disorders where we can identify some varieties as being due to particular genetic mutations and others as perhaps non-genetic causes, and we'll have a lovely neat classification. It really isn't like that. There's huge variation, and the genes that give you risk for language impairment seem to usually um, do so uh, in a way that also will increase the risk for other conditions. There's not a neat distinction between all these different neurodevelopmental disorders, which often also can occur. So the textbook notion of these clean little categories with diagnostic labels completely unrealistic representation of reality, um, both at the genetic level and in terms of what we observe. So my view is that I'm personally quite taken with the idea of using a classification if your aim is to say select what child has, which children are going to get some intervention, I would say a classification based on response to intervention or what we know looking at the child's current behaviour, what predicts that response, or possibly start using more assessments that are actually uh, more dynamic and are actually looking at how well children might respond to intervention. But it seems to me that we should not be worrying about the biology at this stage because it's not going to help us. And we should think about why are we trying to classify? We're trying to really identify which children need help. We're not trying to do a big medical uh, classification exercise or anything like that. And that's the, really the bottom line of what we're trying to do. So I'll stop there. Thank you.